Are you familiar with the term yak shaving? Well, probably not because you clicked on this video, right? So first of all, yak shaving doesn't have anything to do with yaks. So yak shaving is when you have a sequence of small tasks that you need to do before an activity can, uh, can progress. There is a very nice description of where this comes from uh, on the set code in a blog post um, and uh, you can find the link in the description. Hi, I'm Anto and this is Out of the Vops, a YouTube channel for uh, software engineers. Today we are going to see what yak shaving means in uh, software engineering and why you should try to avoid it. The term yak shaving is uh, commonly used in uh, software engineering, in particular in uh, the DevOps world, and it can negatively impact organization, especially large ones. So let's start with an example to better understand the impact that yak shaving can have on uh, organizations. And let's use an example that is specific for uh, infrastructure as code. So let's say we want to create a load balancer, right? So this is um, an apparently simple task that should not take longer than 30 minutes. But I'm going to show you how in large organizations uh, it can take several days. Probably you're thinking this is too much. You cannot go from 30 minutes to several days. But let me give you the example and then, then we'll discuss. So let's try to assume that we work in a medium to large organization. So we have several departments, each one responsible for a different aspects of the software and the, the infrastructure. So, and we want to create this load balancer. Now, to create a load balancer, we may end up with the following resources. We may end up needing the load balancer, obviously, and then also forwarding rules uh, for um, hitting the backend services. We may have um, firewall rules uh, for uh, health checks and for uh, the backend services. We can also need certificates because we are serving traffic over HTTPS, so we need a certificate. And we also need a service account to manage the load balancer, update the certificates and, and so on. So now, as you can imagine, if the organization is medium, not even large, you may hit a number of teams because I can already count a number of security teams like cybersecurity, um, the information security, the network security team, and uh, there is also the network team, the IAM team, and let's not forget about compliance and regulatory and regulatory compliance team. So on top of this, you should also consider that probably your change, you're not gonna nail the configuration for your load balancer first attempt, so you may end up doing multiple changes. So if you have to interact with so many teams, uh, your feedback loop for this change can take, can literally take days. So hopefully you can now see where I'm coming from when I say that a simple change that should only take 30 minutes can end up taking days or even weeks. Okay, but what we can do, so first of all, let's understand what, what is causing this. So this is obviously due to the complexity of large organizations, but also medium organizations, and is also due to the ways of working of individual teams. So if each team works in a silo, uh, you may end up with each team following their own specific protocols for a firewall rules or for certificates or for encryption or for whatever, right? So, and every single time they receive a request, they have to go through their own protocol that is not specific to load balancer, but is specific to uh, all the resources that they manage. So there will be always um, some sort of agreement that needs to be established and this will happen over and over. So now, how this can be avoided? So first of all, let's see where we are wasting time. Time is wasted mainly with interaction with all these teams and jumping in and out of meetings, trying to agree and to get approval for, uh, for changes. And uh, the problem is also related to um, the ways of working because if we have each team working in a silo, we have to follow every single protocol specific for that team. Instead of focusing on protocols that are team specific, we should try to design protocols that are tasks specific. So for example, we can have a protocol that is specific for load balancers that will involve uh, all these teams. So now let, let's go more on a practical side, how we can, uh, we can implement this. This can be implemented with automation and by following continuous delivery principles. So let's say we have our protocol for creating load balancers defined. Now this protocol can be translated in uh, continuous delivery 
uh, pipelines where each step takes care of a specific aspect of the load balancer creation. So now, as you can see, what we have done, we have coded the protocol in the form of continuous delivery pipeline. So now, by providing the input to the pipeline, we can automatically create a load balancer and we can also automatically have approvals from all these teams because now we don't have to describe them the problem we want to solve every single time because it should be clear by the pipeline itself and they can also uh, embed the approval as steps of the pipeline so in some cases some of the rules don't need particular decisions to be taken they can uh, simply be defined as policies as code in, uh, in the form of um, continuous delivery pipeline steps. So what I'm saying with this video, I'm saying that we should always try to engineer ourselves out of the way, uh, because if that can be automated, there's no point in having someone doing always the same job over and over. So hope you like this video. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe, and see you in the next one. Bye-bye.